God bless you. We shall proceed out of God's word this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to a key text recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be unto God which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Shall we read this verse together? Are you ready? The Bible's opened. Amen. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. In every place. The title for this morning's message is Conquering in Christ. Conquering in Christ. Is there anyone in the congregation who could make a guess of this picture? Anybody? Oh, thank God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much. You're, you're accurate. I believe that this year, 2022, is a year of victory for God's faithful people. Not for everybody. But for God's faithful people. See, when I say the word victory, don't think of victory only in terms of physical aspects. Victory in terms of both physical and spiritual aspects. Amen. On the very first Sunday of this new year, we will study just one small part of this verse. Underline the phrase, Triumph in Christ in your Bible. Do you see that in your Bible? Triumph in Christ. Triumph in Christ. In other words, conquering in Christ. Our victory is only in Christ Jesus. Let me teach you this morning. Victory in Christ. From an Old Testament passage of scripture. And we will study from the Hebraic perspective. How many of you are ready? Glory to God. In a way, we ministers of God, we are really privileged because, you know, you are people who love God's word. You know, you listen to God's word very intently. I thank God for you. Amen. Praise God. Victory in Christ. Conquering in Christ. By the way, on the second day of our year end sanctification meeting, I took a study on the same subject you know many of you could not attend because of the terrible rain and inclement weather if you were not there if you are interested for that study the title for that study was we are called to be faithful if you if you were not there if you are interested to study that part contact pastors you know they can make it available you know the video recorder on that day it's a beautiful study how to be faithful in these last days. Okay. Now turn your Bibles to the book of Judges. Book of Judges chapter 6. Verses 11 and 12. Keep your Bibles open to the book of Judges chapter 6. We'll read verses 11 and 12. For the next few minutes, don't allow your minds to wander. Just focus your entire attention on God's word. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you, minister to you in a very personal way. Judges chapter 6 verses 11 and 12. Now I am reading it from the new KGB version. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree which was in Ophrah. 
which belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. What an amazing and timely incident for these last days. We, like Gideon, are up against the evil forces that are trying to return us, destroy our lives, and to destroy our way of faith, our way of Christian life. But just in the nick of the time, the Lord stepped, the Lord himself stepped into that situation and a great victory was won for the people of God. At the right time, he's the present help in the time of trouble. At the appropriate time, the Lord himself stepped in and a great victory was won for God's people. Amen. The Lord's doing is amazing. The Lord is doing the same for us even now, even today. Even today. It's God's plan and purpose that you and I should be victors in Christ Jesus. Not victims, victors. Overcomers. Conquering people. Victorious people in every aspect of our life. Amen. Amen. It's not God's plan to lead, for us to lead a defeated life. Probably you led a defeated life last year, but not this year. God wants to grant you victory after victory. In your personal spiritual life, in your family life, in your secular job, the ministry you do, or whatever field you are in. God wants you to be a victor. How many of you believe this morning? Amen. Now all the names in the Bible They have a meaning Their meaning Had a depth And understanding to the text Which you could never get simply By reading The Bible stories Many of us We just read the Bible as a story Cursory glance But whenever you find a name Coming in the Bible you try to search it out and find the meaning, the Hebrew meaning of that name. That meaning will give you the depth and understanding of the text, which you could never get by simply reading the Bible. You got to do a search and you got to study the Bible. The names in the story tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he did for you and me on the cross of Calvary and what he does for us even today. Can you just imagine from the story of Gideon understanding what the Lord Jesus Christ did, did in the New Testament on the cross of Calvary for his church? Amazing. God's word is amazing. There's so much, there's so much to learn from this book, I tell you. It's like an ocean. Amen. We got to dig deep and, you know, get the treasures. Friend, I tell you, God has not kept the treasures on the surface. Treasures are always in the deep, am I right? If you have to get the treasures, you have to go in deep. Search it out. You have to take a little bit of efforts on your part. Amen. And that's God's plan. Amen. That's God's plan. God has sealed, concealed rather, his treasures in his word. It's the glory of God to. Come on. Conceal a matter. And. It's the glory of the king to. Search it out. Unlock it. Unlock it. We are kings and priests in Christ Jesus. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How awesome it is. The Bible says. The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord came in person and visited Gideon and even called him, You mighty man of valor. It seemed like he was off to a pretty good start until he started going through the laundry of 
laundry list of complaints. Notice that the Bible calls this visitor the angel of the Lord. Underline that in your Bible. The angel of the Lord. It wasn't Gabriel. It wasn't Michael. When you come across the phrase the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, referring to whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Lord Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate appearance visiting this man Gideon. And we call this the Theophany of Christ. Theophany of Christ. Theophany means visible manifestation of God to mankind in a different form. Theophany. The Lord Jesus Christ himself appearing to this man Gideon. And what was Gideon doing? Whining and complaining to him. Now we read two verses, isn't it? Verses 11 and 12. In these two verses, the four names mentioned is quite illuminating. They point out to the Trinity. They point out to the Trinity. Underline the name Joash. You see that in your Bible? It's a Bible study. Keep your Bibles open. Amen. It's not just listening. It's seeing and believing. You've got to seal the word. Amen. And involve yourself. Active involvement in listening. Not passive listening. Joash. In Hebrew, Yohash. Because there is no J in the Hebrew alphabet. Yohash. But it comes from the root word Yahish. It comes from the root word Yahish. Literally means, Yah means what? Quickly, quickly. Yahweh, God. Yish means fire. God fire. Joash means, in Hebrew, God fire. Who is it that is like a burning fire? God the Father. God the Father. God the Father like a consuming fire. Now see the next word. Abiesa. Do you see that in the Bible? Underline it. Abiesa right. That means, you know, Abiesa. Abi means what? Hab means what? Father. Abi means what? My father. Yes, sir means what? Help. So what is the meaning of Abiesa? My father's help my father's help who is that the holy spirit is a helper the holy spirit is a helper and you already know the angel of the lord referred to the lord jesus christ how many of you can see the trinity here god the father god the god the son and god the holy spirit and the name gideon means great warrior Gideon means great warrior. One who breaks. One who destroys. One who cuts off. Now the thought here in these two verses. Verses 11 and 12. The power of the triune God. Had come down to help Gideon. So that Gideon can destroy the works of the enemies. Did you get it? The power of the triune God literally came down to help this helpless man, Gideon. So that Gideon would be strengthened by the power of God and destroy the works of the enemies and deliver the people of Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Amen. Now let's proceed further. Encouraging words. Let's read verse 13 to 16. Look at your Bibles. Judges chapter 6. 13 to 16. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? How many times you have asked this question? Lord, if you are with me, why this is happening to me? 
Lord, if you're with me, why I am going, going through such terrible circumstances? And he's asking in that same verse, and where all his miracles, which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? We heard so much about God and what God did for his people in bringing them out of Egypt. Now what happened to those miracles? What happened to the power of God? If God is with us, why these things are happening? See what he says. But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us come on, into the hands of the Midianites. Now putting the entire blame on whom? This is what man does. It seems Gideon putting the entire blame on God saying, Lord, you have forsaken us and you have delivered us into the hands of the enemies. Why did he do that? Many a time we come to a conclusion that God is an angry God. God is a terrible God who punishes his people. We don't understand God's concern and God's love and God's plan and purpose. Amen. Now Gideon was putting the entire blame on God. But church what was the reason for their plight? What was the reason for their plight? Judges chapter 6 verse 1. The reason is mentioned. The Holy Spirit has made it very clear. Why they were suffering. Why were they going through that path? And why were they in bondage? Judges chapter 6 and verse 1. Look at the Bibles. What does the Holy Spirit say there? And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midianites for how many years? Seven years. The people of Israel did evil, evil in the sight of the Lord, sin against the Lord. They went after idolatry, they went after whoredom. They broke the heart of God. They went after strange gods. And therefore God delivered them into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. Not to destroy them. But to develop them. Not to punish them. But to chastise them. Whom God loves he chastises. Amen. And God was trying to teach them a lesson so that they will realize and turn back to God. And turn back to God. Now if you see Judges chapter 6 verse 1 and Judges chapter 6 verse 13. The last part of verse 13, Gideon says, Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now see verse 1. The second part. Verse 1, the second part. The Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midian. So what Gideon saying was right or wrong? But not fully. Partially. Gideon was telling only the second part of verse 1. And not the second. And not the first part. Many a time, we do the same mistake. We do a similar mistake. We will take a part of the verse which will suit our convenience. Come on, are you with me? When you study a verse of the scripture or when you study a passage, you know, we have a tendency to take only those, you know, sentences, those phrases, which will suit our convenience, which will comfort us. But we will leave the other part the other part would be condition, preserves, commandments. Amen. What God is expecting from us. We will leave that part. And we will take the only that part which will suit our convenience. That's a mistake we do. And that's a mistake Gideon did also. 
Amen. That's not the way to study the Bible. If you are studying a verse, study it fully. Don't just, you know, take one part which suit your conscience or convenience. Gideon had taken only the second part and left the first part of it. Because if he speaks about the first part, he won't be able to blame God. He won't be able to talk about the second part. Am I right? See, for example, I'll give you an example. Turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. Just, just an example. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. And the Lord said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. How do we claim this verse? We leave the first part. Amen. We take only the second part. I will put, God has said brother, God has said, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians. For the Lord said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's fine. That's fine. But what does the first part say? If thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ye to the commandments and keep all his statutes, then, then, it's conditional. It's conditional. So next time when you study the word, be careful about this matter. Take it fully. Don't just leave one part and take the other part which suit, suits you. Amen. That's very important. It's very important. Now I want you to think for a moment. It sounds like you and I at times when nothing seems to be going right and everything seems to be against us. It's so depressing. It's so discouraging. And we tend to complain, murmur, grumble, whine. We tend to say, God has forgotten me. God doesn't answer my prayers. God has left me at lurch. Friend, I tell you, it's not so. Never, never, never at any time God forsakes his people. There were times that we, we have forsaken him. But he had never forsaken us. Somebody can say amen. 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 But thank God. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know standing before Gideon. And Gideon was complaining and whining. And you know. Saying all these things. But the Lord patiently. Wonderful. The Lord patiently listened to all his laments. Then spoke to him. The following encouraging words. See verse 14. See verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said. Then the Lord turned to him. After what? After Gideon putting the entire blame on God. Can you see the grace of God? Can you see the mercies of God? See if we had been in his place. We would have said come on get lost. How much I have done for you. Now you are putting the blame on me. I am not going to help you anymore. Did God say that? No. No. After listening to all his complaints. Then the Lord turned to him and said. Go in this might of yours. And you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? The Lord says. Go with the little strength you have. I want to save Israel through you. From the hands of the Midianites. I am sending you. I am sending you. Now verse 15. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Verse 16. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. God is speaking to somebody. Probably, 
you know, you're complaining, you're murmuring against God and you said, Lord, my prayers are not answered. You have not done this. You have not done that. But God is so patient with us. And God says, don't worry, my son. Don't worry, my daughter. I am with you. Amen. And I will make you, an vict I will make you a victor. And you will defeat the Midianites as one man. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Go in this might of yours. Wait, what? Go in your might? You mean this whining, full of complaints, scared to death Gideon, the man who admitted to be a weakling, that might? Gideon, the weakling, he was so scared. But what God is saying, go with your might, go with your strength. Because it is I who is sending you. If I send you, I will give, also give you the needed strength. I will also give you the needed strength. Church, you do know what the Lord does? What does God do for us? He always gives us the grace. Listen to me. He always gives us the grace to do the things He asks us to do. And when we do those things... Then he turns around and gives us the credit for using his grace. He gave us in the first place to do what we did. Amen. But don't think for a moment it's you. It's the Lord who did it. Are you able to follow me? What does the Lord do? For a difficult task. God gives you the grace to do it. Then when you do it with this grace... God turns around and gives you the credit for using His grace. Amen. But many a time we think we did it. It's not you, it's not me. It is Him. Hallelujah. Gideon goes on to say, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. We are least in the family of Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. It reminds me of Moses, isn't it? When God called Moses, Moses said, Lord, I'm of slow speech and I have stammering lips. I cannot speak, send somebody. Many a time when God gives you a responsibility, listen to me, God is speaking to somebody. When God gives you a responsibility, we are reluctant. Oh, can I do this? Am I efficient? Am I capable? What is responsibility? What is responsibility? Responding to God's ability is responsibility. Responding to God's ability. When God gives you a responsibility, God also gives you the needed ability to fulfill that responsibility. Come on, are you with me? Amen. Don't say, I cannot. Oh, I am not capable. I am not efficient. Never, never. When God wants you to do something, God gives you the needed ability to do it. Amen. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Friend, just I want you to think for a moment. Picture this scene. God was speaking to Gideon something humanly impossible. This Midianites, very powerful people. They were controlling the whole of Israel for how many years? For seven years. But the Lord says, you will defeat them as one man. You will defeat them as one man. Church, I tell you, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But thank God our God is a God of impossibilities. What do you think impossible? It is possible with God. Amen. Nothing is impossible with God. Many times, you know, we see our own limitations and we say, Lord, it's not possible. How can this be? How can it happen? It's not possible. But God says with me, all things are possible. 
I am with you. Surely I am with you. Therefore, what you think impossible is possible. Amen. What better offer he could get than this? God says, I am with you. Surely I am with you. You are going to defeat the Midianites as one man. But still, it wasn't quite enough to convince Gideon. You can see, still he was only focused on him and not on the Almighty God. Are you able to follow me? God's word comes to you. God says, I want to bless you. I want to do a miracle for you. I want to use you. But still, we focus only on ourselves, our weaknesses, our limitations, our drawbacks. Although God had told him very clearly, I am with you Gideon. I am going to give you the victory. You are going to defeat the Midianites as one man. Still, Gideon was not convinced. The reason, he was still focused only on himself and not wholly on God yet. So he asked God, listen to me. He asked the Lord if he might test and see whether he was really the man for the job. Now comes the famous story of Gideon's fleas that he laid before the Lord two times. Look at the Bible. Judges chapter 6 verse 36. Judges chapter 6 verse 36. Very interesting passage. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, Look, I shall put a fleece of wool. Underline that in your Bible. Fleece of wool. On the threshing floor, if there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Verse 38. And it was so, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Amen. You can see that in the picture. What is the test? Dew on the fleece. Lord, when I get up next morning, I want to show me a sign. I want this fleece of wool should be drenched in the dew. Amen. And the ground around that fleece should be dry. And when he woke up the next morning, it was so... And he could run the dew out of the fleas, one full bowl of water. God did it. God did it. Amazing. See verse 39 now. Then Gideon said to God, he was still not convinced. Still he was only focused on himself and not on God. Verse 39, Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just one more with the fleas. Let it now be dry only on the fleas, but on all the ground let there be dew. Verse 40, God did so that night it was dry on the fleas only and there was dew on all the ground. Amazing. What was his first request? Fleas should be wet. The ground should be dry. The second test flea should be dry and the ground should be wet, drenched with dew. God did it. God did it. It seems that Gideon was testing God because he could not believe what God told him. God said, surely I am with you. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man. But Gideon couldn't believe the word that came out of God's mouth. Many a time when God speaks to us, we are finding it hard to believe. Hard to believe. Sometimes when God speaks, it's too good for us to hear that. Amen. He could not believe the word. God very categorically told him, you are a mighty man of valor. You don't know the potential that is within you. You only see your weaknesses. You only see your frailties. 
But Gideon, I have, you know, put so much of potential within you, which you are not able to see. Still Gideon had problem to believe God's word. Now the question is, can we test God? Come on. Come on. No, we cannot test God. The people of Israel tempted God. And God was grieved. So can we test God? No. But here, here, God allowed it. God allowed it. You know why? Because there is a spiritual truth for you and me. God allowed it. What is the reason? God doesn't allow anybody to test him. God allowed it here because there is a spiritual truth for you and me. Church, we got to understand when we study the Bible, for those people, it was an incident. It was an event. But for you and me, truth. You should never forget this. See, Gideon, Gideon certainly you know, would not have understood all these truths what we are studying today. It was just an incident for him. But for you and me, God has kept truths hidden for you and I to appropriate, to take it. Amen? So what is the truth in this? What is the truth in this? Most, most of us would have probably heard the story of Gideon's fleas. I'm sure. How many times you have just thrown out the fleas when you needed a sign from God to get you know assured of his guidance but beyond that beyond that hidden in this story is a beautiful picture what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross of Calvary beautiful picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross of Calvary now this story is recorded in which chapter? Quickly. Chapter 6. Why so late? Chapter 6. Why it is in chapter 6? Six? 6 is the number of what? Man. So God becoming man for you and me. And doing something for us. That's why it is in the 6th chapter. Amen. And these point out to Gideon's two requests. His first request was what? Dew on the fleas. Imagine. Dew on the fleas. Ground dry. Write it down. Dew on the fleas. Ground dry. First request. Dew on the fleas. Ground dry. Number two. Fleas dry ground wet with dew fleas dry ground wet with dew right now listen to me now listen to me what kind of animal from which we get the fleas of wool sheep very good very good why such an obvious question I ask you this morning to point out that the Holy Spirit is at, it, is at it again, drawing a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Amen. Because you get the fleece of wool, unless you kill a sheep, you cannot get the fleece of wool. Am I right? If Gideon is having a fleece of wool, it means, it means a sheep was killed. Amen. How many of you can see the picture? The Holy Spirit of God is drawing here a beautiful picture of Jesus, Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain on the cross of Calvary. The Lamb of God, slain even before the foundation of the world. Before the Lord Jesus Christ came down to this earth. The whole world was dry. The whole world was dry, thirsting for the living water. And where was the living water? Amen. In Christ. Triumph in Christ. Conquering in Christ. Can you connect that? Where was the living water? In Christ. 
All the living water was contained in the body of the Savior. Fleas full of water. Fleas drenched. Amen. That fleas, how did he get the fleas? How did he get the fleas of wool? Sheep was killed. Don't forget. Now that's one part. The first part, fleas was wet. Fleas full of water. The living water was contained in the body of the Savior. The second part. The day he died on the cross of Calvary, when the Roman soldiers pierced his side, outflowed blood and water. The fleas, water came out of the fleas. Amen. The fleas, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. When he was pierced in his side, the water came out of him. And drench the ground. That's how you and I are blessed today. How many of you are excited? I am I'm really excited. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The living water, the Lord Jesus, came to bring deliverance. That gushed forth to quench the thirst of the whole world. Paul says in Philippians, he emptied himself. Amen. He emptied himself for your sake and mine. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say on the last day of the feast of the tabernacle? Turn your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 37. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day of the great day of the feast of the tabernacle, the Lord Jesus Christ stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Verse 38. Ye that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow out rivers of living waters. Amen. Then if you go to John's gospel chapter 4, what did the Lord Jesus Christ say to the woman of Samaria at the well of Sychar? In verse 13, Whosoever drinketh of this water that you are trying to draw out, you will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into an everlasting life. Amen. How many of you understand the fleas now? Now do you understand why God allowed that test to be tested? The reason he allowed himself to be tested so that you and I can understand what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross of Calvary. Are you able to follow me, church? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amazing, amazing. Amen. Oh yes, and one more thing. Remember how God pared down Gideon's army down to 300. That's 300 men. Now 300 in the Bible numerics stands for victory. Number 300 stands for victory. Hebrew students, can you make a guess why number 300 stands for victory? Sheen. The 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Sheen. Its numerical value is 300. The letter Sheen represents what? El Shaddai. El Shaddai. The almighty God who gives us victory. Amen. That's the reason we lift up our hands. I told you already, when we lift up our hands, we represent God because this is the letter Sheen. Amen. This is the menorah, golden lampstand. We represent the Lord God Almighty when you lift up your hand and praise God. Hallelujah. So don't forget, number 300 in the Bible stands for victory. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ gained total and complete victory over all the forces of the evil through his death on the cross. Amen. And that's the real meaning of Gideon's fleas. Yeah. This is the real meaning of Gideon's fleas. Yeah. It's something amazing, God's people. Amen. 
Now just imagine God reducing Gideon's army from what? From 32,000 to 300. Can you imagine? God reducing the people in the army of Gideon. God reducing the strength of Gideon's army from 32,000 to 300 was a test to those people. But it was a lesson to Gideon. What is the lesson? Not to depend on his own strength, but to totally depend on the strength of God. Amen. Sometimes it will seem that God is taking out your strength. Some people are favorable to you, God will remove them. Sometimes, you know, something which will be supportive, God will remove that. You may probably say, what God is trying to do? I'm losing my strength. I'm losing the support. I'm losing the favorable things. Friend, I tell you, God does it so that you will not depend on your own strength, but totally depend on God. God reducing the strength of the army of Gideon was a test to those people. Was a test to those people. But it was a lesson to Gideon. What is the lesson? What is the lesson? Not to depend on my strength. Not to depend on my army. Not to depend on my family. Not to depend on my bank deposit. Not to depend upon the job that I am having. Not to depend on my own resources. But to depend only on God. Amen. Amen. How many of you know by the way when Joseph was cast into the pit. Who was not there? Reuben was not there. When he was sold to the Midianites, Reuben was not there. Other brothers, you know, picked up Joseph from the pit and sold him to the strangers. And Reuben was not there. Why? Why? God, in his wisdom, removed Reuben from that scene. You know why? Because Reuben was the only man, only brother, who was concerned about Joseph. If Reuben was there, had been Reuben there, he would, he would not have definitely allowed his brothers to sell Joseph to the strangers. If Joseph had not been sold to the strangers, if he had not gone to Egypt, he wouldn't have become the premier of Egypt. Come on, are you with me? Friends, sometimes God removes those people who help you. God removes the support from us. God removes the scaffolding. So that you will become beautiful. Have you seen the construction work? When the construction work is in progress, you will see the scaffolding all over, supporting. But once the project is over, you remove the scaffolding so that you can see the beauty of the building. I tell you, I don't know to whom God is speaking this morning. God is removing the scaffolding from your life, the support from your life, so that your life will become beautiful in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes you are depending on something. You are depending on some people. Amen. But don't worry when God does it. Because God wants you to be, become, become more beautiful. God wants his purpose to be fulfilled in your life. God wants his plan to be accomplished in you and through you. Amen. God further encourages Gideon. Look at the Bibles. Judges 7. Come to Judges chapter 7. We'll read from 9 to 12. Judges chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with, come on, are you following me in the Bible? With, Come on. Louder please. What's the problem? Pura. With Pura. Your servant. And you shall hear what they say. And afterward your hand shall be strengthened. To go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura. His servant. To the outpost of the harm men. Who were in the camp. You know what God is saying? Gideon. If you are afraid. If you are fearful. 
Although I've assured you that I'm with you, although I've showed you signs that I'm going to grant you victory, and still, if you are scared, if you are fearful, then take Pura, your servant, with you. Take Pura, the servant, with you. Now listen to me, church. I've heard many, many preachers preaching on this passage, referring Pura to the Holy Spirit. Don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. See, I've heard preachers saying, if you're afraid in your situation, take along with you Pura, the Holy Spirit. No. Pura means, in Hebrew, bearing fruit. Pura in Hebrew means bearing fruit. Pura means growing. Growing. Pura is not referring to the Holy Spirit. But you know what God was saying to Gideon? If you are afraid, take with you someone who bears fruit. Take with you someone who is growing in the knowledge of God. This is where fellowship comes. This is where fellowship comes. Are you able to follow me? In your difficult situation, you must have fellowship with someone who bears the fruit of the Holy Spirit, who grows in the knowledge of God. That person who bears the fruit of the Holy Spirit will have a servant mentality to serve you when you are in need. Amen. But if you are going to fellowship with some other people, barren people, spiritually barren people, those who do not grow in that spiritual life, I tell you, they will put out your flickering lamp. Are you following me? So with whom you fellowship is very important, very important. See, we come to church, we cannot fellowship with everybody. Listen, don't misunderstand me. Even in the congregation of God's people, you and I have to identify those who bear fruit. Those who grow in the knowledge of God. If you fellowship with such people, in times of your difficulty, in times of need, in times of natural fear, they will be by your side and serve you. Amen. As a servant. Because they bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They will be very much willing to serve you, encourage you, strengthen you, build up your faith so that you can come out victoriously. Fellowship is important. With whom we fellowship? Bible says you shall know them by, by the fruits, not by the words they speak. Sometimes they will speak sweet words, but spiritually barren, spiritually not growing in the Lord. If you're going to fellowship with such people, spend time with such people, I tell you, you're also going to become barren. Your spiritual growth is also going to be stunted. Fellowship. That's what the Lord's saying unto Gideon. Go with Pura. Pura means someone who bears fruit. Someone who grows. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It's very, very important. Very important. Amen. That's why Brother Reynold Bonke once said, don't follow the parked vehicles. You will go nowhere. If you follow the parked vehicles, you will go nowhere. Follow someone who is progressing. Follow someone who is moving forward. Someone Follow someone who is growing in the Lord, who is bearing fruit in the body of Christ. It's very important. Now verse 12. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And the camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. Can you see the strength of the army here? They were like sands in the seashore. Multitude. Numerous. They were like locusts. Do you see what I mean? How can a mere man go up against such a formidable, innumerable army of people as a single man? The Lord said, you shall defeat them as one man. As one man. But you see a multitude. 
Humanly speaking, impossible, brother. Pretty, you know, intimidating. But God knew that there might still just be a little bit of fear in Gideon. And so the Lord told him to take servant Pura down into the camp of Midian. Amen. This is where we need fellowship with one another, body of Christ. As I told you earlier, fellowship with the spiritual people. You will know them by the fruits. Fellowship. That is very, very important. When you are in trouble, when I am in trouble, only spiritual people can help us. Not all can help us. When you are in trouble, you need spiritual help. More than physical help, you need spiritual help. When you are spiritually helped, you will easily come out of your physical problems. Amen. There they would overhear something. Now Gideon and Pura, you know, stepping into the camp of the Midianites and they overheard something, what they were saying and that totally turned the tide and increased them. Amen. Something amazing. Let's continue the story. Now I want to tell you the importance of Shofar, the trumpet. Look at the Bible, Judges 7. Judges 7, 13 to 18. 13 to 18. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, there was a dream and another man in the army's camp interpreting it. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped, worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pictures and torches inside the pictures and he said to them look at me and do likewise watch when I am come to the edge of the camp you shall do as I do when I blow the trumpet I and all who are with me then you also blow the trumpet on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon now listen to me Gideon says something very important Gideon says, you watch me and when I and hundred people are with me, when we blow the trumpet, I want all of you to blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet. There is something spiritually significant about blowing the trumpet. Now the Hebrew word for trumpet literally is shofar. Shofar. Now listen, do you know what a shofar is? Do you know what a shofar is? Shofar is nothing but ram's horn. Ram's horn. Shofar is nothing but ram's horn. How many of you have seen this? Amen. If you go to Israel, you can buy one. I bought one, but I cannot blow it. <laughs> it's very difficult. Ram's horn, shofar. This is a trumpet the people of Israel used. This is a trumpet. When you read the word trumpet in the Bible, this must come to your mind. Ram's horn. Now, you, you got to answer this question. How do you get the ram's horn? How do you get the ram's horn? By killing a male lamb. You get this ram's horn by killing a male lamb. It brings to remembrance the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You cannot get this ram's horn without killing a male lamb. If you have to get this ram's horn, you have to kill a male lamb. So it brings to remembrance the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn the pages of your Bible to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. 
How many of you remember that? I've given you a clue. Oh, praise God, praise God. Wonderful, wonderful. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. Genesis 22, 13. Are you enjoying the word? Yes. Glory to God. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Trumpet. Trumpet. Abraham could see a trumpet. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Amen. A ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Now listen, God is speaking. There was a conversation, beautiful conversation, transferring between Abraham and Isaac on the way up to Mount Moriah. And Isaac asking in verse 7, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. What is he saying? What is he talking about? He is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that God the Father is going to provide for mankind. Amen. Abraham was prophesying about what's going to happen after 4,000 years. Can you just imagine? My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham was talking about lamb. But what was sacrificed? Ram. What is ram? A male lamb is a ram. Ram is nothing but a male lamb. Referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The ram died in the place of Isaac. The Lord Jesus Christ died in your place and mine. Amen. Now church listen to me. Now Abraham sacrificing the ram as a burnt offering. We all know the story. I need not go into the details. God stopped Abraham killing his own son. The heaven moved in haste and said, Abraham put not your hand upon your son. And when Abraham turned behind, he saw the ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And now Abraham offering the ram as a burnt offering. You know what happened? When he offered the ram as a burnt offering, everything was burnt. That's a burnt offering. Everything is burnt except the horns. Amen. Everything in the ram was burnt except the horns. And later, this was the horn the Jews started to use as a sign of victory. Amen. How many of you understand about the ram's horn? Hallelujah. Referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the death. Amen. By killing the male lamb, it brings to remembrance the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is said that the demons tremble and flee in terror at the sounding of Shofar. Well, and as, you know, as we shall see little later, indeed those enemies, hallelujah, fled when the Shofar was blown, when the trumpet was blown, when the ram's horn was blown. The enemies were scattered. The enemies were destroyed. They ran in abject terror. There's something very powerful about this ram's horn church. Don't forget. What happened when the people of Israel went around the wall of Jericho? How many of you remember? Blew the trumpet. That's different. But what's exact? Turn your Bibles. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 5. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast, long blast, that is in Hebrew it is called tekia gadola, tekia gadola, long blast. And when he long blast with the ram's horn, with the ram's horn, and when he hear the sound of the trumpet, shofar, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Amen. 
ram's horn reminds us of the victory that the Lord Jesus Christ won on the cross of Calvary through his death. Amen. Church, are you with me this morning? Glory to God. Now I would just want to say something and close this morning. The darkest hour comes. The darkest hour comes. Look at the Bible. Judges chapter 7. Reading from verse 19. Judges chapter 7. Reading from verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Underline it in your Bible. The beginning of the middle watch. Just as they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pictures that were in the hands. Verse 20. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the mud pots, pictures. They held the torches in the left hands and the trumpets in the right hand for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fled. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is really dark outside? Listen to me. It was the darkest hour. It was the middle watch. It was midnight. What is really dark outside? Even the tiniest light can be seen for miles. Am I right? Amen. Do you know? What was the darkest hour in the history of the whole world? Oh, when the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, was hallowed when he gave up his ghost on the cross of Calvary. Amen. It was the darkest hour. In the darkest hour, the Lord Jesus Christ was taking victory over Satan and all his powers. Turn the Bible for a moment to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27 and verse 45. Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 27 and verse 45. Now, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Amen. Exactly. You see that happening in the instant of Gideon. In the darkest hour, God was granting victory to the people of Israel from the hands of Midianites. Amen. Amen. How many of you can follow me this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Church, well imagine the confusion there. All of a sudden, you see your encampment, you know, surrounded by torchlights, presumably from a very big army, and you're, you know, hearing the sound of shofar blasting. What will you do? Panic. That's what exactly happened there. Amen. They were so freaked out and started to kill each other in the confusion. Some people fled in terror, leaving behind. All their own. For God's people to take up the spoil. God is speaking brother. Sister God is speaking to you. Amen. In the darkest hour of your life. God is planning a tremendous victory for you. God has planned a tremendous mashing victory for you. In the darkest hour of your life. Now look at the Bible. Judges 7. Reading from verse 22. Reading from verse 22. When the 300 blew the trumpet. And the Lord said every man sword against his companion. Throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia. Toward the Zerira. As far as the border of Abel. Mehola, by Tabat. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali. Asia and all Manasseh. And pursued the Midianites. Verse 24. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. Now listen, verse 25. And they captured, captured two princes of the Midianites. Who are they? Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb. They killed at the wine prince of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. It was a complete rout. Not only that, but they captured, this is something important. They captured the two princes of Midian. 
Oreben, Zeb, killed them, brought the heads to the other side of Jordan, killed them, and brought the heads to the other side of Jordan. Sign of victory. Now let me tell you more secrets in the Hebrew language. Hebrew language. They were the princes of Median, Medianites. Median means, the Hebrew word Median means strife. Median means strife. Confusion. Chaos, commotion. Strife. Now the name Oreb, Oreb, comes from the Hebrew root word Erev. What is the meaning of Erev? Darkness, evening. Evening. Oreb. It comes from the root word Erev. Meaning evening. And the other name Zeb. Zeb means wolf in Hebrew. Zeb means wolf. Now I want to ask you a question. Listen to me. What do wolves go after? Sheep. Amen. When? In the darkest hour. In the evening. Evening speaks of the end of the day. It's speaking about the last days. Evening speaks about the last days that you and I are living in. Church, I want to tell you, listen to this. This is very solemn. In these last days, we have almost come to the evening. We have almost come to the end of the day. We are in the last days. You know, like now, there will be ravening hooves. Ravening hooves. The devil's minions. They will go around looking to devour over the sheep of God's pasture. The church. That's the meaning of Horeb and Zeb. Sheep trying to devour God's pasture. Amen. God's people, sheep of God's pasture. In the evening time. In the darkest hour. The end of the day. If you're not careful. Church, God is warning you on the very first Sunday of this year, 2022. If you are not careful about your spiritual life, Horeb and Zeb, they are against you. The wolves, the ravening wolves, are against God's, you know, the sheep of God's pastures. They are trying to devour you. But if you are faithful, God will give those Horeb and Zeb into your hands. As God gave the head of Goliath to the, into the hands of David, God will give the heads of Horeb and Zeb into the hand of the church of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just with 300 very few by comparison to the number of the Midianites. They were multitudes like grasshoppers. When these very few faithful people. Friend listen. Many are called. Few are chosen. Fewer are faithful. That's what we studied on the second day of the year in sanctification meeting. 32,000 people. Who are they? Called. How many left? 22,000 people left. How many remained? 10,000. They are the chosen. And how many faithful out of 10,000? 300. Many are called. 32,000 people called. How many remain? Only 10,000. They are the chosen ones. But finally, how many remain? 300. They are the faithful ones. Faithful ones are very few, I tell you, church. Today, many are called. Many come to church. Many listen to the messages and teachings. But I tell you, very, very few people take it seriously. Take it seriously. And they decide in the heart and saying, Lord, I want to be faithful to you, God. Whatever happens in my life, I want to be faithful. With those faithful people, with the 300. Amen. When they shouted and blew the shofar, they proclaimed the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blowing the trumpet means what? Blowing the shofar means what? Proclaiming the victory of Jesus that he won on the cross of Calvary and lifted up the name of Jesus that is above every other name. God started to fight that battle. 
Amen. God literally fought the battle. The people of Israel did not fight the battle. Am I right? They just broke the pictures, held the torch, and blew the trumpet. That said, who fought the battle? The Lord Jesus Christ fought the battle. Amen. He will fight for us and we will completely victorious over the enemies that have sought to steal, kill and destroy. How can we blow the trumpet? How can we blow the shofar? By lifting up the name of Jesus in our praise and worship. Every time you lift up the name of Jesus in praise and worship, friend, I tell you, you're blowing the shofar. Amen. And when you blow the shofar, God will come into the scene and will start fighting on your behalf and God will grant you victory. Hallelujah. The devil, the enemy shall be put to naught and shall be destroyed. I want to tell you in closing, God wants to restore everything the enemy has stolen. I don't know to whom God is speaking. Probably the enemy has stolen your good health. Or probably the enemy has stolen your finances. Maybe the enemy has stolen your strength and potential. But this morning the Lord says, when you lift up the name of Jesus in praise and worship, God wants to restore everything what your enemy has stolen. And we get all the spoil. How many of you believe this morning? Hallelujah. I just want to leave three words with you this morning. Shine, partake, and shout. Shine, partake, and shout. So church, earthen vessel, earthen vessel containing the light of God. What was inside the picture? The lamb. Amen. The earthen vessel. You and I, we have the light of God deep within us. The earthen vessel containing the light of God. But when we break ourselves, when we allow ourselves to be broken, your light will shine brightly, no matter how small or dim it may seem to you, but shine through the darkness of this fallen world. Amen. Sound the shofar. By lifting up the name of Jesus, the enemy has to flee. Hallelujah. When he hears the shofar sound. How many of you believe this morning? Will you close your eyes right now? I feel the wonderful presence of God. Shouting praises to God. And that's how we blow our shofar today. Thank you Holy Spirit. If possible why don't we stand up to our feet. Church in so doing. Righteousness will again rule over our land. As we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is greater than Gideon. I want to tell you this morning as God spoke. The battle belongs to the Lord. And the victory is ours. Amen. Just hallelujah. Just join hallow the army. Just join the army. Hallelujah. Commit your life to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord, my brother. Amen. And the victory is yours. Hallelujah. Do you feel that you're fighting a battle? Oh, deep within yourself, in your spiritual life, you're fighting a battle. At times you feel that you are defeated. Sometimes you feel that you are falling again and again. In that same area you are struggling. This morning the Lord says. My son, my daughter. I will fight your battle. The victory is yours. Hallelujah. I believe with all my heart. This year 2022. If you are faithful to the Lord. The Lord will fight your battle. Conquering in Christ. Our victory is only in Christ Jesus. How could Gideon take the victory? Only in Christ Jesus. Only in Christ Jesus. How beautifully the Holy Spirit. Had drawn the picture. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Defeating the enemy on the cross of Calvary. In the Old Testament passage. How many of you can thank God this morning? Believe what God has spoken to you, friend. Don't doubt the word of God. What you think impossible, God can do it for you. God can do it for you. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can do all things. Sometimes the devil comes and whispers in your ears. You cannot. 
You cannot. You are not efficient. You are not capable. You are good for nothing. You are hopeless. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. He is a liar I tell you. God wants you to do the impossible. Because our God is a God of impossibility. Thank you Jesus. The Lord is speaking to you. The Lord says my child. My child. What you think impossible. I am going to make it possible in your life. Probably you think there is no way that you can come up in life. But the Lord says. I will lift you up. I will lift you up. Put your trust in me. Depend on me. Fix your eyes on me. Don't depend on your own strength. Your strength will fail my brother. Sister your strength will fail. Your intelligence. Your knowledge. Your experience. Your ex expertise. Everything will fail. But God's strength will never fail. Thank you Lord. Come on lift up your voice and thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory for you, God. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we once again praise and thank you this morning. Thank you, God, for teaching us your word. Lord, your word is infallible, immutable, life-giving, life-transforming. Beseech you, Lord, that you will continue to speak your word to our hearts. We want to keep on listening to you, Master. Continue to speak to our hearts, God. Even now we pray for this congregation. Bless your people. Lord, they love you so much. They love your word. Therefore, bless them abundantly, Lord. Bless them abundantly. Touch them right now. And bless them in every sphere of life. So that they will be mighty witnesses to their own families, to the people around them. And in the place where they work. Lord, put a difference between your people and other people. So that your name will be highly exalted and glorified, Father. We thank you this morning. Send us with your presence and with your blessing. All glory and honor be ascribed to thy holy name, Father. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray.